Welcome to the Fat Emperor podcast. I'm your host, Ivor Cummins. We're supported by the Irish Heart Disease Awareness Charity, which advocates a simple CT scan to reveal your CAC score. So know your score and take action to prevent that premature heart attack. Everything you need to know will be right here. Dr. Paul Mason, finally get to catch up with you all the way from Australia. Pleasure's all mine. Excellent. Yeah, I've been watching some of your videos and they're superb because you are going through all of the detail of the lipoproteins, but you've also got the clinical experience with patients, many, many patients where you're getting to see this in real life play out. So maybe today we'll talk a little bit around these LDLP and LP little a and some of these advanced lipoproteins and what they really mean. One of my favorite topics. Right. So where do we start then? Well, I guess LP little a is one that's becoming very popular out there in the press. And a few years ago, you'd hardly hear about it. Mm. Now, I've done quite a bit of research on LP little a, but I think you've gone that step further. So maybe the context around LP little a, when it's bad, when it's high, when it may not be bad, when it's high, kind of what it's all about for someone who gets a high LP little a reading. Well, I, I guess my first thought on LP little a is that it's just a surrogate marker. And I guess what I mean by a surrogate marker is that it, it's there, but it's there by association, not by causation. So as you well know, uh, the little uh, molecule um, that LP little a uses to attach to the ApoB100 moiety, when that gets secreted, that gets se secreted separate to the B100. And it only attaches to the ApoLipoprotein B100 when it's oxidized. So the existence of lipoprotein little a by definition reflects the presence of oxidized LDL. So in, in other words, oxidized ApoB100 particles, LDL particles. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have oxidation on the ApoB100 moiety of the LDL particle, then the little a will not attach. Right, so people with uh, low LP little a, it's obviously a good sign. Yeah. People with higher LP little a indicates more oxidized lipoproteins, which is not a good thing. Uh, but interestingly too, certain um, genetic peoples, like I think in Africa, LP little a does not associate with worse outcomes at all. And interestingly, the Katavans, or could be the Semain people with no heart disease really, their LP little a I noticed was higher than the LP little a in the heart attack men in the 4S statin trial. So there seems to be a lot of, it's still a very ambiguous measure, even though, as you say, it should indicate a problem. Well, I think part of that just reflects that, I guess, LDL and, you know, quote unquote, cholesterol full stop, it doesn't give us a full risk profile. I mean, it's not the only factor that's going to be contributing to cardiovascular disease or stroke risk or something like that. So it's important that we don't all of a sudden start looking at cholesterol and LDL oxidized or not in isolation. If you've got other risk factors going on, that's important too. Yeah, and it may over, if you have many important risk factors in a good place, then having an isolated one may not really have any impact on the system worth, worth a, a damn possibly. Yeah, yeah we, we've got to look at the whole picture here, mm. the whole package. And I mean, that's what I guess mainstream medicine has tried to do with their risk calculators. Um, you know, they say, well, how old are you? Are you male? You know, that increases your risk. Do you smoke? And they pluck all of these things into their calculator and they come back with a number. Now, unfortunately, a lot of what they put into their calculator is just erroneous. So, I mean, they're, they're looking at total levels of LDL and some of these other things sometimes. But uh, the concept of a risk calculator is actually quite good. It understands that it's a multifactorial, uh, uh, there's a multifactorial contribution to risk. Yeah, and in fairness, then you put together your factors of choice and you get a much better risk projection than, the, than you would with any single risk factor for sure. Now, I guess if you do a calcium scan, you're way better than all the risk factors in the risk calculator put together because it actually sees the disease. But yeah, in, in the absence of getting a scan and actually finding out the disease level and the risk, the risk calculator can can fill a gap. Yeah. Yeah, the, or or the presence of LP little a, but or you know oxidized LDL, but just understanding that you you shouldn't take them in isolation. Absolutely, it's a multifactorial issue, and picking a single factor is 
what a weak engineer might do. <laughs> so LP little a then does reflect generally oxidized uh, LDLs and I know, knew they were intimately connected to each other for some time. I also remember having a paper where most of the LDL involved in the plaque was actually of the LP little a type as opposed mm. to classic LDL. So that would also tie in. Yeah, I mean, I think this just reflects that oxidized LDL is the stuff that will penetrate through the endothelial lining, and that's the stuff that's going to form the plaque. If you have a healthy LDL particle that's not modified, and by modification I mean either glycation where you have sugar attaching to the B100 or oxidation of the LDL particle, if you don't have either of those factors there, then it's just not going to end up in the atherosclerotic plaque. And the reason is because it travels there inside a macrophage. Well, well, it doesn't actually, it, it resides there inside a macrophage. It doesn't actually travel there. And the only way it gets inside the macrophage is through a scavenger receptor on the macrophage. And those scavenger receptors have no affinity for a healthy LDL particle. It's not going to stay there. Well, and if you take it back a little further then, Paul, and some of the work I've been doing recently, so if you take normal, non-oxidized, non-glycated, non-damaged LDL particles in your plasma, they're yeah. in your blood, and then you can, of course, have oxidized LDLs in your plasma, in your blood. Mm -hmm. A million dollar question is, can ordinary LDLs go across the endothelium and become oxidized and become macrophage, become part of the problem? Or is it only oxidized LDL in the plasma, even mildly oxidized, that can really go across the endothelium and become part of the atherosclerosis process inside the wall? So I think on the balance, I mean, it's almost always oxidized that would cross. But I mean, I would hesitate to say that, mm. you know, non-oxidized could never cross. But the point is, if it could cross, it could come back again because it's not going to be bound up by a macrophage. Yes, true. Though they do sometimes, some lipidologists say once they go in, they can come out, but they will get trapped on proteoglycans. Like the proteoglycans are trapping your healthy LDL to hold them and oxidize them. That's a, that's one viewpoint. Mm, I'm not sure that's substantiated by empirical evidence. Yeah, I would agree. There's a paucity of evidence uh, conclusively showing that. So oxidized LDL, I think you can safely assume. And actually, Paul, I remember I had a few papers from Eastern European teams, uh, not from American teams, where they took oxidized LDL, very mildly oxidized, not the hardcore macrophage level, and they found that 40% of endothelial cells would die when exposed to these mildly oxidized LDL, but mm. not when they use native LDL. And they also showed entrapment much higher for oxidized LDL than native LDL. So I guess that would tie in with your belief that oxidized LDL is, is inherently a driver. Yeah. And native LDL is probably not so much something to... Oh, for sure. Yeah. And I think the, we can take it back a step. Mm. And it's glycation of the LDL which often precedes oxidation. So having high blood sugar levels... It means that you've got these uh, LDL particles floating around in this soup and they're more likely to be exposed to the sugar molecules. And there's a process called non-enzymatic glycation, which basically means it's a con concentration driven process. The sugar will attach and that sugar attaching actually can generate reactive oxygen species. So the very process of glycation in some instances is enough to oxidize that LDL particle. Um, but by being glycated, it also means it can't be taken out of circulation by the liver. So the residency time in the circulation will be prolonged. And obviously, the longer it's sitting there, then that's also going to be more likely to be oxidized just on a time perspective. So it's the glycation and the sugar in the first place that does the damage. And that's certainly one agent of jap damage. And in the population nowadays, we know in America, around 70% of people are essentially diabetic. So that's going to be a huge driver of LDL damage in yeah. any case. Um, there are other sources of LDL damage, I guess, but that would be the big one. Yeah, well, I mean, look, we there's other risk factors um, that will increase the likelihood. So the omega-6 oils, polyunsaturated oils, the of the omega-6 variety, they're much more prone to oxidation. 
And we know that, and there's some really nice studies out recently where they're actually looking at the structure of cell membranes, you know, comparing omega-3s and omega-6s. And it, it really does um, set it up. So if you've got a longer residency time and you're, you've got these pro-inflammatory omega-6s sitting in the membrane or, you know, sitting within the particle, then obviously it's, uh, or even in the circulation, you're going to set yourself up for trouble. And that's pure synergy, yeah. So you've got a combination of vegetable oils excess, which ironically the heart organizations push, uh, combined still. still, amazingly, if you're listening out there, <laughs> um, but also then the excessive glycation from hyperglycemia and post uh, prandial sugar spikes from the kind of sad diets our people are eating. So you've got this terrible synergy to damage LDL particles and have them become part of the... Cascade. And then, as you said, then they can also damage the, the endothelial cells. In turn, so we've got this... this cascade. Yeah, a cascade and, and a self-reinforcing loop, I think, in some cases. It's yeah. shocking. So the other thing is, I remember a paper where the LOX1 receptor in the endothelium and it also takes part in many parts of the atherosclerotic. Oh, sorry, is that the LOX one on L the macrophage? The, also, the same thing. Yeah. So I have a paper which I was fascinated by, and it basically says that oxidized LDL is the problem and not native LDL, 2009 mm. paper. But what they showed was the LOX one is on the macrophage, the LOX one is on the endothelium taking mm. uh, oxidized LDL from the plasma into the wall, and it's involved in around four other places yeah including the macrophage so lox one is involved everywhere but well not all... necessarily just lo i think there's actually six separate scavenger receptors on macrophages and lox one being only one of them yes and I, I think there's another one or two that might actually be able to be involved in that process oh true there are many and it's very complex but i think what this team was saying that even just looking at lox one mm. It comes up in so many parts of the atherosclerotic cascade. Yeah. But their real point was that it illustrates that oxidized LDL, even in the plasma, not just trapped in the wall, yeah. is a fundamental part of atherosclerosis. And native LDL, they basically pushed aside and said not relevant. Exactly. And yeah. it's probably also worth pointing out here mm. that uh, the reason oxidized LDL is so bad because it can generate something called reactive oxygen species which are basically uh, unbalanced valence shell electrons that will then basically go and uh, they'll, uh, they'll, they'll do damage to what they come in contact with. And there's really neat evidence that antioxidants can actually reverse or prevent some of this damage, not reverse it. Once you've scrambled an egg, it's a bit hard to undo that. <laughs> um, and but one of my favourite examples is something called uh, Gilbert syndrome which uh, in medical school, that, that's an Australian pronunciation. I think they like to say Gilbert syndrome. Yeah, uh, very posh. I don't, well, we try, <laughs> it's French. <laughs> so, but this is actually a condition where you have elevated levels of bilirubin in the circulation, which is a potent antioxidant. And we call this a syndrome. We say you've got Gilbert syndrome. But if there was any one syndrome which I could have, it would be this because it's actually associated with a significantly reduced risk of cardiovascular disease. Significantly reduced. It's, I think it's in the order of 50% or something like that. Massive reduction. And purely because I'm, uh, I'm surmising here is the antioxidant potential of the bile going around is probably undoing some of the, uh, the damage um, of the oxidized LDL particles possibly before they damage other structures. Right. And Gilbert's is not particularly problematic in itself. I, I don't think there's a lot of morbidity or mortality. No, well, it actually reduces mortality. That's the whole ah, point. Yes. Your chance of having a heart attack if you have Gilbert syndrome is a hell of a lot less than if you don't. As I said, if there's a syndrome I could have, that would be it. Thanks for tuning in, guys. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see my subscribe button in the middle of the screen, a free viewing of the Widowmaker movie on the far right, and myself and Dr. Gerber's book, Eat Rich, Live Long, on the left.